Berlin, July 1938. A woman enters the railway station and shows her travel documents to Nazi guards. She is small and slight, and she seems nervous. She boards the train, where she greets another man, and they travel together towards the Dutch border. Are they lovers, perhaps? No, this is not a tryst. It's a rescue. The woman is an Austrian named Lisa Meitner, one of the most brilliant nuclear scientists working in Germany. She is of Jewish descent and is fleeing Hitler's regime when it is almost too late. The Nazi leaders have introduced a policy prohibiting all scientists from leaving Germany and they have forbidden Meitner a German passport that would offer her freedom to travel. At the Dutch border, a Nazi military patrol makes its way through the train, checking documents. Meitner's travelling companion is a Danish chemist named Dirk Koster. He's been helping German refugee scientists in the Netherlands, and he's got permission from the Dutch authorities for Meitner to enter the country but all she has by way of papers is her obsolete Austrian passport. Meitner later recalled how she felt at that moment. I got so frightened. My heart almost stopped beating. I knew that the Nazis had just declared open season on Jews that the hunt was on. For ten minutes I sat there and waited. Ten minutes that seemed like so many hours. Then one of the Nazi officials returned and handed me back the passport without a word. Minutes later, she was safely across the Dutch border. Back in Berlin, Meitner's former scientific collaborator, the German chemist Otto Hahn, received a cryptic telegram saying that the baby had arrived. Meitner's flight from Germany cost Hitler's regime dearly. On holiday in Stockholm during the Christmas of 1938, she was told about the latest results Hahn had obtained in his work on the radioactivity of uranium. And she realised what Hahn did not, that uranium atoms in Hahn's lab were splitting in half and releasing some of their tremendous store of nuclear energy, a process that was christened nuclear fission. Seven years later, that same process was triggered inside a bomb called Little Boy, dropped over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. The rest, you might want to say, is history. Except that it is a history still all too present today, when the threat of nuclear conflict lies once again over the world. It was Meitner's insight that began the nuclear age. In the early 20th century, it was barely possible for women to work in science at all. And yet two of them were at the forefront of understanding the structure of the atom. The first is one of the few female scientists most people have heard of, Marie Curie, the Polish woman who pioneered the study of radioactivity. Lisa Meitner is the other. Albert Einstein once called her Germany's own Marie Curie. Meitner was born in 1878 in Vienna, where she later studied science at the university. By 1907, having got her doctoral degree, she went to the University of Berlin to research the exciting new field of atomic physics. Marie Curie's discoveries in radioactive decay of uranium had led to new insights into the structure of atoms. At their heart was a tiny, dense nucleus in which a tremendous amount of energy, nuclear energy, was locked away. Scientists realised that it might be possible to use this nuclear energy if only they could find a way of controlling its release. Let it out gradually, and you have a source of almost inexhaustible power. Let it out all at once, and you have an explosion the like of which the world had never seen before. In 1914, H.G. Wells called such a device an atomic bomb. (laughs) 
Shortly after Lisa Meitner arrived in Berlin, she met Otto Hahn, an expert in the chemistry of radioactive elements like uranium, and they decided to work together. But women weren't permitted inside Hahn's chemistry institute at the university, allegedly because its director was convinced they would set fire to their hair in the laboratories. Meitner was given a room in the basement, but forbidden to come upstairs even to talk to Hahn. Yet her determination and sharp mind soon earned her a reputation and the respect of her colleagues. By the 1930s, she was among Germany's foremost nuclear scientists. Then everything changed. Achtung! In January 1933, Adolf Hitler, leader of the National Socialists or Nazi Party, was appointed Reich Chancellor, head of the German state. Swiftly, he transformed Germany from a democracy into a dictatorship. In April, the Nazis expelled Jews from all places of power and influence, including academic jobs. Somehow, precariously, Meitner managed to retain an academic post for a further five years. She continued to work with Hahn, who was now director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry in Berlin. But their joint discoveries were attributed to him alone. Hahn and Meitner, assisted by a young German chemist named Fritz Strassmann, were attempting to peer inside the atom. But when Germany annexed Austria in March 1938, being an Austrian of Jewish descent in Berlin was no longer merely anomalous, but perilous. Hahn, who had been Meitner's closest colleague for 20 years, capitulated to the pressure and told her that she must leave his institute. Meitner recorded bitterly in her diary, He has in essence thrown me out. Although out of a job, Meitner learned that she was to be prevented on the highest authority from leaving the country. Her friends and colleagues realised that they had to get her out fast. That's when Dirk Costa came to her aid. He'd already written to Meitner in May 1938 to invite her abroad, and on the 11th of July he finally received official confirmation that Meitner would be admitted into the Netherlands. He set out at once for Berlin. On the night before her escape, Meitner stayed at the house of Otto Hahn and his wife. Hahn made poignant amends for his failure to defend her by giving Meitner a diamond ring inherited from his mother as an emergency fund. The escape was a closer shave than they realised, but it worked. By the end of the next day, she and Costa were safely in the Netherlands. Hahn and Strassmann continued the uranium experiments, but without Meitner's expertise, they had difficulty interpreting what they saw. They found that uranium could turn into radioactive substances that seemed chemically similar to barium. That was odd. Radioactive transmutations were thought to happen only a little at a time. Radioactive decay would turn one element into another with very similar mass. Yet barium had barely half the mass of uranium. What was going on? Close to Christmas, Hahn wrote to Meitner in Stockholm. He said, Perhaps you can suggest some fantastic explanation. We understand that it really can't break up into barium. So, try to think of some other possibility. Meitner discussed the peculiar results with her nephew Otto Frisch, another exile from Germany. They decided, in the face of prevailing wisdom, that the uranium nuclei really were splitting more or less in half, raising the prospect of an enormous release of nuclear energy. They called it nuclear fission. To find out more about Lisa Meitner and what it was like for a woman working as a scientist in early 20th century Germany, I spoke to historian of science at the University of Cambridge, Patricia Farah. 
From very early on, she felt herself to be an outsider. She was so good at mathematical subjects at school, but of course, when she was being brought up in Vienna, women couldn't go to university. And then later on, she went to Germany, and again, she was on the outside, but she was the first woman to become a professor in Germany. And then there's, of course, also the fact that she was Jewish, and although she'd converted and become a Protestant, she was very, very much an outsider in 1930s Germany because of that. And right from the outset, she began to work with Otto Hahn, the key relationship in her life. What was that relationship like? Well, I think with both Otto Hahn and the younger physicist that Hahn later employed, a man called Strassmann, they were both very anti-Nazi and pro-Jewish. So at the outset, I think their relationship was very close. It was a very collaborative relationship. He was a chemist and she was a physicist. And the crucial set of experiments, the one that would prove so formative in both their lives, was when they bombarded uranium with neutrons and they wanted to see what would happen to the atom of the uranium. And most of the experiments up till then had shown that if you bombard a uranium atom with neutrons, a little bit sort of chips away. And their results completely overturned that assumption. And one of the things that Lisa Meitner did was she kept asking Otto Hahn to repeat his experiments because she couldn't believe the results. She was very sceptical about it at first, and then he did repeat his experiments. And then eventually she and her nephew managed to work out what had been happening. This was the experiment that Hahn and Strassmann did after Meitner had left Germany where they had these results and they didn't know how to interpret them and they sent them to Mike. Now, what happened then? There's this lovely story. It was one Christmas and she and her nephew went for a walk and he was on skis and she was walking and they were discussing this and they sat down on a tree trunk and they got a piece of paper out and started scribbling all the equations. And it was her who worked out the maths of exactly what it was that had happened and she imagined the nucleus of uranium being like a giant drop and that somehow the uranium drop had got squeezed into the middle and then split into two parts. It was like a biological cell splitting into two, and that's why it's called fission. It's called that after the biology. And it was her who did all the physics of all of that, but that part that she played was written out of the story. And no one had appreciated before that something like this could happen to an atomic nucleus. No, it just didn't seem to have crossed their minds, and that's why the results were so bewildering. And I think it's very easy in retrospect. It seems so self-evident. But you have to remember, if you go back to since radioactive phenomena were first discovered in the early 20th century, nobody knew what it was. It was all so mysterious. They were all feeling in the dark, and nothing like this had ever happened before. Do you think they had any sense when they were doing this work of where ultimately it might lead? They had absolutely no idea that they were leading to nuclear fission. It certainly wasn't an aim. It certainly wasn't an aim as far as Lisa Meitner was concerned because as soon as she realised that enormous amounts of energy could be released through this reaction she said I don't want to have anything to do with an atomic bomb and she was asked to work on the atomic bomb project and she refused to do that. But while these experiments were happening other scientists scientists became aware of the potential and various people contacted Albert Einstein and asked him to write to President Roosevelt in America and urge President Roosevelt to start an atomic bomb program in America because these scientists were very worried that the Germans might be developing a bomb and from their perspective it was important that the Americans should get the bomb before the Germans. So there was a sort of general awareness in the late 30s that it might be possible but it was their experiments that suddenly made it absolutely feasible to carry it out. After the war, Lisa Meitner was in a quite a strange situation because, of course, she'd been in Germany until almost the eve of the war, working within the German system and then had had to flee. And now she was faced with negotiating a relationship with those of her colleagues who'd stayed behind and worked under Hitler. After the war, she kept criticising Hahn, for example, with whom she'd worked so closely, for having effectively been complicit with the Nazis 
by not showing any resistance whatsoever and not helping anybody. And she accused him of making lots of concessions. Hahn was very, very worried about his own position because he'd kept Lisa Meitner employed in his institute until 1938. And between 1933 and 1938, it was increasingly difficult to do that. And gradually, he had dissociated himself from her to protect his own interests. So, for example, he'd left her name of publications. And so by the time she left, it was actually quite dangerous for him to be seen associating with a Jewish person. And she got that sort of reaction from other people as well. So very, very mixed reactions. I, I think Again, it's so easy for us to judge in retrospect. Everything that happened during the war just seems so terrible to us. And then, according to what a lot of German people say, a lot of them had no idea. Things change a little bit a day at a time, a month at a time, a year at a time, and suddenly you wake up five years later and you realise you're living under an appalling regime. But there was a sort of collective erasure of memory, so people would refer to experiments that she'd carried out, but they wouldn't mention her name in association with them. And she said it was as though her whole scientific past was disappearing. So one of her problems was that she felt completely uprooted, not only physically in terms of living in a new country, but also that her own past was disappearing behind her as though she was a non-existent person. I mean, what Hahn did was effectively take all the credit, and it was quite clever the way he did that. He made a very, very sharp separation between physics and chemistry. And of course, in the structure of the Nobel Prizes, physics and chemistry are separated and the two prizes are awarded by very different committees. So once Hahn had dictated that the discovery of nuclear fission was a chemical discovery, then it was very easy to marginalise her. Historians are still arguing about why Germany never developed an atomic bomb during the war. The bombing raids of major cities like Berlin made it hard, ultimately more or less impossible, to do science there. But perhaps the physicists didn't understand the problems well enough anyway. Or perhaps they never convinced, or never really wanted to convince, the Nazi authorities to give them enough money. All the same, they were arrogant enough to imagine that they knew far more than the scientists in Britain and America. And they were incredulous when they heard in August of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Lisa Meitner refused to play any part in the Manhattan Project in the US, in which the Allies developed the atomic bomb. But rather to her dismay, she found herself celebrated in post-war America as the Jewish mother of the bomb. Wrong on all counts, because she never counted herself as Jewish by faith, no matter what the Nazis said. Meitner tried to persuade her former colleagues in Germany to acknowledge their failure of responsibility in staying quiet during the atrocities of the Third Reich. She didn't exonerate herself from that. She said to Hahn, It was not only stupid, but very unfair of me not to have gone away immediately. It took Hahn many years to admit any culpability. But he did. In 1958, he wrote to Meitner on her 80th birthday. We all knew that injustice was taking place, but we didn't want to see it. We deceived ourselves. Come the year 1933, I followed a flag that we should have torn down immediately. I did not do so, and now I must bear responsibility for it. He thanked Meitner for trying to make us understand and for guiding us with remarkable tact. Although nuclear weapons could be considered the legacy of Meitner and Hahn, most of them today don't use nuclear fission, but the even more energetic process of nuclear fusion. These are the thermonuclear hydrogen bombs developed during the Cold War. Collectively, the world's current nuclear arsenal could now obliterate all life on the planet many times over. One of the organisations trying to change that is the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, based in Geneva which this year was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for its work in trying to reverse nuclear proliferation. Patricia Lewis works with ICANN and recognises Meitner as a pivotal figure. She was an inspiration 
for me in my work as a physicist, but then became an inspiration in my work in looking at nuclear nonproliferation, nuclear disarmament issues, because of her very strong passion, along with a number of other scientists, that this was a very poor use of the technology, which had enormous benefit for medicine, enormous benefits for energy production, uh, but the idea of making weapons out of them, she, along with many others, thought that this was an aberration. And Meitner's work is a prime example of how fundamental scientific research, so in her case in nuclear physics, turns out to have tremendous social and even political consequences. To what extent do you think scientists can be expected to anticipate those sorts of applications of their work and to consider the ethical aspect? When you're at the forefront of the beginnings of scientific understanding, that's so exciting in itself. The mathematics involved, the quantum physics, the way in which we began to understand the nucleus as a community dominates. But at the same time, People are always talking about what sort of use it could be. I think you can see that now looking at discussions about genetics, for example. We're talking about it now with artificial intelligence. Despite the excitement about the science, we're very much aware of what sort of impact it might have on society. And that was certainly true then. But of course, what happened was the understanding of how to do this really came to fruition during World War II. And the big fear was that Germany would get the bomb and the Nazis would have a nuclear weapon. And so the Manhattan Project was established and they created the first nuclear weapons. And once they realized that Germany didn't have that capacity, many of the scientists left the project. Her role in speaking out, I think that was a very difficult thing for her to do and demonstrates her independent character. It seems it was really trying to bring home the fact that one works within a social context, whatever research you're doing. Yes, and I think that remains true. And we still see today scientists trying to pretend that somehow their work is pure and it has no social implication and somehow they shouldn't dirty themselves with that. Well, you know, wake up and smell the coffee. It seems in the 1950s, in particular at the height of the Cold War, there were scientists who were trying to do something about this problem of nuclear proliferation. That effort has been going on ever since. Yes. But it seems as though with the establishment and the work of ICANN that perhaps something has started to shift. So if we think about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, it was negotiated in 1968 and that would be 50 years ago next year. That treaty was supposed to bring about nuclear disarmament. It was a 25-year treaty and in 1995, it got extended for another 25 years. So we're reaching now two lots of 25 years in which there has been progress. There have been a lot of reductions, certainly since the end of the Cold War. We're down in numbers now to the thousands rather than the tens of thousands, but it's still thousands of weapons around. And it's clear now, I think, to most people that although... The nuclear weapon states, those that possess nuclear weapons, don't want other states to get them. They also don't want to get rid of them for themselves. They say they do. They say they want multilateral disarmament. But there hasn't been a negotiation at the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva for over 20 years. They don't want it that much. So what ICANN has done is they were able to drive, along with a number of key countries, a process within the UN that negotiated a new treaty. So the first time in many decades we've got a new treaty now that has large numbers of signatures on that should enter into force fairly quickly that prohibits nuclear weapons, legally prohibits. And the idea behind that is the same as the way in which they approach landmines and cluster munitions and indeed chemical weapons. So nuclear weapons, if you like, are being brought back into the fold of all types of weapons and their humanitarian impact. So that's the first thing they do. They change the game. And then they helped really support the states that were pushing forward to create this new treaty. So that's a major accomplishment in the UN. So this young group of people have also formed an international network um, that are very active in countries all over the world. And they've brought this issue back into this generation, this new generation of young people who are fired up and energized. And basically what they're saying, it seems to me, is that these were your weapons to the older generation. They're not ours. We don't want them going forward. You've promised to eliminate them. Let's just get on and do that now. So do you think that it's fair to say we are living in a, a more dangerous world today than we were perhaps even during the Cold War, or are things getting safer? 
I think the Cold War was perhaps the most dangerous time. That's not to say that the situation we're now in is safe. It's not. And um, in fact, what we're seeing, it seems to me, is a clear move towards an increased proliferation of nuclear weapons. So some of the scientific work that's being done on this now is really questioning whether or not nuclear weapons deterrence still holds. Because it seems to me that one of the big problems that we've got, and it's certainly something that ICANN is addressing, is that we are saying, say, in this country or in the United States, France, Russia, China, and so on, that nuclear weapons provide a deterrent and therefore prevent conflict, right? That's sort of the basis of the idea behind it. Whereas when North Korea decides that it wants nuclear weapons for that purpose, we are against that. So it seems to me that what we've been selling is an idea and that countries like North Korea and perhaps some other countries have bought into this. So what we really need to do is get underneath the thinking here and question it. And the problem is that we've become so entrenched in the ways that we think about these things that we've formed ourselves into almost like religious tribes and we almost can't have a conversation. So what ICANN has done is brought this out into the open and challenged the conventional thinking. Of course, a lot of people don't like that, but the truth is it needs to be done. Patricia, I'm, I'm struck by how when the discussion of nuclear weapons began straight after the war, it was Lisa Meitner who was one of the people who most clearly was against them and in some ways acted as a broader conscience for, for German physics. Her, but also Marie Curie's daughter, Irene, was also very clearly against nuclear weapons and how that in a way, sort of reflects the fact that for ICANN, it has been, I think, young women in particular who have been driving this process forward. Is there some significance in that? This is such an interesting question, I think, because what I see from that generation with Marie Curie, Irene Curie, Lisa Meitner, these women were brilliant, just as brilliant as the men involved in physics and mathematics at the time. But they were outsiders. They were let in reluctantly. In the case of Lisa not even given the Nobel Prize that she was clearly deserving of. But they had a different view. And it seems to me that when people are on the fringes or on the outside, they often have a very different view of what's going on. And so they bring a different brain, a different experience, a different knowledge to the process. And this is the link, if you like. The young women from ICANN have had a completely different view of what's going on. And they've called it, they've seen it, they've described it, and they've taken it forward. So I see the direct link between Lisa Meitner and the ICANN women. Although Lisa Meitner never won a Nobel Prize for her work, many scientists believe she should have done and she was nominated dozens of times. But she has an honour some think is even more precious. A chemical element named after her. The 109th element in the periodic table, called mitnerium. It's a fitting accolade. But perhaps what does better justice to Meitner herself is the testimony on her gravestone in Hampshire in southern England, where she died in 1968. It calls her a physicist who never lost her humanity.